Thank you all for coming out and uh, being a part of today's service uh, here with us at Dakota Baptist. To all my friends that have come out uh, to hear me, uh, it's not about me. Uh, thank you for coming because I want you to hear from God today. Uh, so you've kind of been set up. Um, but it's in love. You've been set up in love. You've been set up in love. No, it really is. It really is. Uh, because I love each and every one of you. I love everyone here. Uh, and I want you to know that for me. But more than importantly, God loves you. Uh, and so today we're going to hear a message from him. Uh, God uses men to speak his word and his truth to us. He's not here to do it himself. And he says, who shall I send and who can I send? And the Bible says in the book of Ephesians that he sends preachers, he sends pastors, uh, he sends elders uh, for the perfecting of the church, for the building up of the saints. So the very purpose that men are left here to speak his word is so that you can hear from him. So that's what I would ask today is that you would attend to listen, not to hear Patrick, but to hear God. Because in these words that I will speak, they are his. They are not mine. God bless you. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Father, Lord, we thank you for this time uh, to which we have come, Lord, to hear your word. Father God, I pray right now that I decrease uh, so that you may increase, Father God. May I hide behind the cross, Father God, that you and only you might be seen. Father God, speak a word into the hearts of the hurting that are here. Father God, you know each and every situation uh, that is going on. Uh, Lord, as we lift from the text your word, I ask that you again would make it plain, make it clear so that men might understand, Father God, that even the children might understand, Lord, and that they might be uh, converted and come to you in a personal relationship in a personal way. I thank you now in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. What a lovely name. What a lovely name. Jesus. Um, there were some words that were spoken in that song uh, that resonated with me, and it says basically that he will return in the clouds. Uh, this is a true saying. Uh, we can go to the book of First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we can see that Christ one day will return to this earth. Uh, and that's why it's so important uh, that we, one, know, uh, and then two, that we come to a saving faith and a saving belief in him. This is why it's so critical. Uh, so I want to start uh, first by saying, is it well with your soul? The song we sang was with intent. It was with purpose. And again, these are God's words speaking to us, every one of us here in this place. Is it well with your soul? Ask yourself that question. You don't have to answer me, but ask yourself that question. Uh, because at the end of life, it's going to need to be affirmative that it is well with my soul if I am to be with him for all of eternity. Because all of us are destined for a place, either heaven or a place called hell. That's the unfortunate truth. However, because God is a just God, he must execute justice. And in execution of his justice, it's either that we believe on his son, Jesus Christ, as our only way to get to him or that we will space an eternity separated from him. So I would ask if you would today, if you could turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. Uh, this is where we'll be coming from. This is what God has laid on my heart to share. And as you're turning there, uh, I think we can all say and agree that many men and women today are hurting. There's a lot of pain in this world. Uh, there's loneliness, despite the hundreds of friends on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, you name it. Despite the hundreds of friends, there's still loneliness. There's disease. Despite the existing best medical care we have known to date, there's still disease and it hurts. And it still takes us away from this earth. There's death, despite the fact there is hope in Jesus. There are accidents, despite the fact it was that, that it survived and now that person has one more chance to follow Christ. We face problems. Despite the focus on inward self-strength and resiliency and meditation, poverty, despite the fact that less than 1% of the dollars spent on the world's weapons can educate every child. I want to say that one again. Poverty, despite the fact that less than 1% of today's revenue that is spent on the world's weaponry can educate every child. We face hunger despite the fact that the world produces enough food for all 7.3 billion of its inhabitants, though 795 million are still undernourished. The list can go on and on. These facts are evidenced in the de desperation that we see in our people today and that we see in people that are walking around among us today. On a deeper level, many feel per no purpose, no meaning, no significance. They feel helpless, they feel hopeless and empty. I submit to you, man's heart has been blinded by the God of this world. 
We can find this so in the book of 2 Corinthians, verses, chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, and I'm going to read it in your hearing. And even as, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. These are those that don't know Jesus Christ. In their case, meaning those that don't know Jesus Christ, the God of this world, that is the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Why? To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, of Christ who is the image of God. So I want you to know what I've been praying this week. Uh, one for this message, uh, not for me, uh, but for all of us that would be here today to hear it. Uh, whoever that w was and is that God is destined to be here. Uh, I want you to know it's not by chance that you're here. Yeah, you may have come out because you were invited and received an invitation, uh, but this is a divine appointment for each and every one of you that are in this place today. Uh, and that's something that's important to understand. Uh, it is with this backdrop, however, that we arrive at our topic for today's message. And that is simple, two blind men. Because the text that we're going to be looking at in Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34, it's the end of the chapter, chapter uh, is going to be talking about two blind men. And we're going to try to lift some things out of this that is going to be beneficial for every one of us here. Before we go there, however, if you could back up to verse 17, and we're going to read there. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief, unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. So keep that in your mind as we go down to verse 29 and pick up again. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside. When they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us. O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? They said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Uh, the way I like to approach the text, it's as easy as for me and I hope that it's as easy as are as easy for you as well, and that is I would like us to go verse by verse through 29, uh, from 29 through 34, so that we can get an understanding of what's here. And again, so that we can lift out the critical points that I think we need to be uh, aware of in, the, in today's message. Uh, so we have the setting. What is the setting? The setting is the road leaving Jericho bound for Jerusalem. So Jesus, as we read back in verses 19, I think it was, or 17, 17 through 19, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. There is a purpose and point for Jesus now being en route to Jerusalem. Jesus is coming to the end of his 33-year ministry upon this earth, and he's now headed to the cross. Uh, we sang about his glorious return. But however, before he got to the return, he must first have come and died. And this was with point, and this was with purpose, because God spoke this years ago. And by years ago, we're talking some 400-plus years ago, God spoke that he would send his son, uh, that he would die on a cross in your and my place. Because therein lies the purpose of the cross. Not for him. He was a sinless God. And he still remains today a sinless God. That was for you and for me. That was for you and for me. That's why he went to the cross. So here now we have Jesus journeying to the cross. And again in verses 29 through 34 we see there is a purpose. The setting was again the road bound for Jerusalem. The players in this text are the disciples, the crowd, two blind men, and the Savior. Those are the folks that we see in this text. There were differing reasons for the journey. As I just mentioned, Christ to die for mankind's sin, for your and my sin. That's why he was going. Uh, and on the other hand, we had the crowd. But before we get there, let me go. And let me read this to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You don't have to turn there, but if you would, you can, you can verify it yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For those of you that are taking notes, he says, For he, this is talking about God, hath made him, talking about Jesus, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, Jesus knew no sin, 
but God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Why? That we might be the righteousness of God in him or by him. So the express purpose of Christ going to the cross was so that we might become the image of the righteous God. But that's only done through him because we don't have it in us. It doesn't rest in man. It doesn't rest in us. This is called substitutionary atonement. And it means satisfaction or reparation for a wrong or injury. In other words, an amends. I'm sure most of you can quote John 3.16 in this room. You've probably heard it numerous times, I'm sure. I'm going to hear it or uh, read it for you again. And it says, for God so loved, and you can put your name there, the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world through him might be saved. That's the express purpose. Again, now we have also the crowd that is following Jesus to celebrate the Passover. So we're talking about those differing reasons for the journey to Jerusalem. Jesus to die, now the crowd following Jesus, and also following Jesus so that they could also get to the Passover that was about to happen that particular week uh, that they were leading into. And so there were differing reasons even within the crowd for them following Jesus. Uh, just as today, there are differing reasons that some of us are, that all of us are in this place. Some of us is because, hey, I have a true belief in Jesus Christ, that he is the savior of the world. Some of us, hey, I might have just been invited. Some of us is, hey, I am searching. I'm in pain. I'm hurting right now. And I have need, I think, to hear from God. So he speaks to us all. In verse 30, back on our text, and it says, And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And so herein lies the problem. Blind men sought sight, but they were greatly opposed by the crowd. Look at it again. Blind men sought sight, but they were greatly opposed by the crowd. There's a message in that for some of us here today. Some of you are seeking sight, and by sight meaning spiritual sight, you are looking for a release. You are looking for an opportunity to come and to serve the God of heaven and earth However, there are obstacles that stand in your way. There are obstacles that are standing in your way. Now, let's see, and we already saw, but we're going to touch it again on what these two did in order to overcome said obstacle. If you're familiar with John chapter 4, there was a Samaritan woman at the well. And as that text begins to open in John chapter 4, verse 1, and it says, and Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Jesus must needs go through Samaria. That's the woman at the will. Some of you are familiar with that story. But the must needs is a piece that I am trying to hinge on right now to show that it was the divine purpose that Jesus went through the town of Samaria so that he could have an appointment with this specific lady at the will. There was a specific point uh, that he went through there and a specific timeline that he had to follow and that she had to follow in order for them to link up. Today, this is your divine appointment. You're here not by chance. You're here because God sent you here. That's why you're here. Critical thought. So as these men were sitting by the wayside, and here comes now Jesus and a crowd. Now remember, they are blind, so they don't see Jesus. Remember that. They're blind. They don't see Jesus. They hear a crowd, and in the crowd, I can imagine they're picking up voices of what's going on. Like, what's, what's, what's all this about? Because it says that a multitude followed him. So it was a lot of folks. And so now in the voices of the folks that they heard, they heard something about the name of Jesus. They heard something about son of David. Something else to, to, uh, to recognize and realize is, think about it for a second. They didn't know that he wouldn't be passing that way again. And so timing is everything, right? Divine timing is everything. They didn't know that once this crowd and Jesus got past them, that if they did not, if they did not catch him at that moment in time, that they would miss out on that opportunity forever. They didn't realize that. They didn't know that. Because remember what Jesus was going to Jerusalem for. He was going to be executed. That was his express purpose for going that route. So he would not be coming back by their place and by their way again. 
again, a message for some of us here. The word has come to you. Grab hold of it while it's here because that opportunity may not be there again. I implore you that opportunity may not be there again. It hurts my heart. I'm almost in tears now as I tell you this. You guys heard about it, I'm sure, because it was all on CNN, uh, the ship crash uh, that, that happened last weekend, I think it was, last Saturday, the seven sailors that died. I'm sure they got up that morning thinking nothing of it. This is just another day on the job, right? We're going out to sail right here in the coast of Japan. Nothing's going to happen, nothing to worry about. And now they're gone. They've now left time, and now they've stepped into eternity. And so that's why it's so important. Don't let this message pass you by. Don't miss this opportunity to hear God, because he's here. He's in this place. Moving on. Jesus said this, well, Isaiah, I'm sorry, the prophet said this in 55 and 6. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Again, the lesson, seek him while he may be found. Because the insinuation is, is that he won't always be findable. Right? So we have to seek him while he may be found. And when he is near, we must call upon him. While he is near. Because again, that time goes. That crowd, remember, Jesus passing by those blind men on the road. Had they not called out to him, they would have missed that opportunity. They would have missed that opportunity to hear from God and to be healed of their blindness. The very thing that caused Jesus to stop in this same verses 31 through 32, and he says the crowd told them to keep quiet. That's that opposition. But they cried all the more. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus stopped called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? So now in we have the solution. They persisted and they persevered despite the obstacles that hindered. Again, a word for someone here today. Don't let people, don't let things stop you and hinder you from getting to God. If you need to hear from him and if you are looking to hear from him, don't let men, don't let me, don't let your spouse, don't let kids, whatever, the job, don't let anything get between you and the master because he has a word. He has what you need, what you're looking for. I want to read something from the book of Luke. Um, you don't have to turn there, but if you'd like, you can. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 10. He also said to them, suppose one of you had as a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. Then he will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything, because he, because he had, but because he is a friend, I'm sorry, yet because of his friend's persistence, persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching, and you will find. Keep knocking, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who searches, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So again, the very thing that made Jesus stop and become attentive to these men was not because they shouted out and cried out one time, though I'm certain God heard him because he hears and knows everything. What he was doing was building in them to make sure that this is something that they desire. And so, men, when we were uh, after our spouses, uh, if we're married, uh, that young lady uh, that we wanted to date, we were persistent, right? She may have turned us down the first time. Hey, you know, can I take you out on a date? Uh, no. Okay. And what'd you do? You, go, you went back again, right? Because that was something you greatly desired. Well, we must also greatly desire God and greatly desire to be healed of the blindness that we've already accomplished or that we've already read about is within mankind that is a part or that don't know and have a personal relationship with Jesus. We've been blinded. And so if I want healing from that blindness, I must be persistent about calling out to God. I must be persistent. So if he didn't hear you the first time, keep calling. Don't stop. That's what I'm saying. So why must we persevere? It grows our faith. 
It teaches us endurance, experience, victorious living, and hope. It gives us more time for thought, more time for meditation, more time for truth searching for the real thing that I am in need of. Because I may not understand at the beginning that what I really need is this. And so the persistence and or God's quietness causes us to yearn more and to seek out more and to learn more that, man, I'm really missing that personal relationship. And that's what it is that's missing in my life. That's the ticket, is that thing. It allows more time for a greater number of people also to be reached and greater witness for God. Some critical thoughts of that verse that we just read are those verses 31 through 32. One, the feet and the voice of the followers, the feet and the voice of the followers, remember these were blind men, the feet and the voice of the followers of Jesus will direct the desperate to him. The feet and the voice of the followers of Jesus will direct those who are desperate to him because he's the only one that's got the answer. And in this case, that's what we saw in this story, is that the feet and the voice of the crowd led these men to Jesus. Two, the spiritually blind and desperate must seize the opportunity. And so that's what we were talking about a moment ago, is don't let the opportunity pass you by, because who says that when I walk out of here today that I'm not going to get hit by a vehicle out here in front of the church? Well, I can be careful, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I got you. You can be careful, you know, and you can make it across the street safely, but who says that your heart is going to keep ticking? You see what I'm saying? God holds the very heartbeat and the very breath that we breathe. All of that belongs to him. He's the holder and the keeper of it. And none of us knows our days. None of us knows how many days I'm going to have on this earth. So when you hear the word, when he calls out to you, respond to it. Timely fashion. Verse 33. Lord, they said, open our eyes. So they made their request known to the Savior. And so I submit to you today, for those of you who may not have a personal relationship with him, this is what you have to do. Lord, open my eyes. Meaning make your request known unto him. He is faithful and just to hear your request. He is not going to turn your request away because God says this in his word. He says, my will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his will. His will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so if you call out to him in a sincere heart, he cannot, he cannot lie because he said it himself. I'm a God and I cannot lie. He cannot lie. So call out to him. Hebrews 11 and 6. Something else to note. Uh, these men had never seen Jesus Christ before. I'm certain they had heard about him because no one else that had come on the scene were doing the miracles that they were doing. And by the miracles, meaning healed in blind eyes, blind eyes because they weren't the first that he, that he healed of blindness. Uh, he had raised some dead, uh, meaning Lazarus, uh, who was dead and in the grave. The Bible says that he had began to stink. Uh, that's what his sisters said, uh, but he was still able to raise that man from the dead. Uh, there were numerous other things, uh, de demoniacs basically that had been released uh, of the demons that were living within them. Uh, so a number of things had been done, and nothing like this had ever swept this earth before, and nothing like this had ever been seen. And so these men no doubt had heard the word because word like that spreads, right? Word like that spreads. That's amazing. Uh, and so now having not seen him themselves, they had a faith. And so what I am getting across and trying to get across to, to you tonight, today uh, is you too must have faith. It is by faith that we receive the thing that we need from God. It is by faith, nothing else. It's not that I deserve it. It's not that I earned it. It's by his grace, which means undeserved favor. It's by his undeserved favor, he will give you the faith to believe in him. All I have to do is ask. That's it. All I have to do is ask. Verse 34. And we're coming to a close here, guys. We're not going to be long. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately they could see, and they followed him. So, Jesus' response here, basically the very thing that drove Jesus to them and caused him to touch them, meaning to give them what they needed, was the compassion of his heart. And in his great compassion, Consider, here is Christ on his way to do what? 
We've established that in the beginning. He was on his way to die on a cross. Yet on his way to the cross, he was still willing to stop and attend to the need of these men. Meaning there was nothing that was too small, if you will, for him to give attention to. And so while he's on his way to the cross, he attends to the need of these men, which was to hear their blindness. And I, I submit that it was more than just the physical blindness that he healed with these men, but that he also healed them of their spiritual blindness because they followed him after they received their sight. They followed him. Their response was to follow him. In Romans 12 and 1, it says this. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies to Christ as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of service. So for those of us who have given ourselves to Christ and that we believed in his only begotten son to have died on the cross in my place, that's that uh, substitutionary, I'm sorry, atonement that we spoke about a moment ago. If I believe that, then I am to give myself back to him because that is the most logical thing that I can do. Because here is a man that would give his life for me. Here is a man that would give his life for you because the Bible says that he died for the sins of the world. So I'm going to say this, and it's going to sting a little bit. God bless you. I love you. It is in love. Some of us don't believe and won't believe right now simply because we have hardened our hearts. It's not that God is not reaching out to you. He is. He is. He's reaching out to you right now. And some of you are sitting here right now with hard hearts. I don't know who you are. You know who you are. Let this sink down into your ears that God loves you and he wants a personal relationship with you. And the only way that you can get into that personal relationship is to believe on his son, Jesus Christ. Understand that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through his son, Christ Jesus. That's it. That's the only way. The gift of love through his son, Christ Jesus. Four takeaways and we're done, guys. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate you listening uh, today. Uh, again, for, for my friends that have come out, I love you. And I want you to know that. Uh, so this message, I know it comes across a little tough, may come across a little butthole -ish. That's not the intent. The intent is out of love to show you and share with you the truth and the way. Because Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This is Jesus talking. No man comes to the Father except through him. So the only way that I can get back to God, and I say back because we have been separated from God by our sin. And so therefore now we, every one of us who believes, has been given the ministry of reconciliation. There's no reconciliation required when there is no separation. We reconcile things that are separated. And so we have been given that ministry of reconciliation. And so this is my attempt to you, is to reconcile you to God. Be reconciled to God because he's reaching out. He loves you. Point one of this lesson uh, that we've gone through today. Basically, man has been spiritually blinded. blinded. We've already read and established that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, that basically there has been a veil placed on man's heart by the God of this world, the God of this world being Satan. He's an enemy to God. He's an enemy to God, and he's an enemy to you. Though it may seem good, though it may feel good, though it may look good, all of those things that lead to and, and tend to our flesh, all that stuff looks, feels, sounds, all that great. But in the end, it leads to destruction. He does not love you. Satan does not love you. I was there. He did not love me. He did not love me at all. But he made me feel good. He made me happy about myself. You know what I'm saying? And that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. I'm going to segue real quick and tell you my testimony if you don't mind. Uh, so I was living in sin. Um, I was living in sin. I was in a bad way. I had been brought up in church. When I left home to come into the military, I said this to myself. I said, I'll never go to church again because I had a drug problem when I was a kid. I was drugged to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, <laughs> every Thursday, every Saturday. Uh, I, I had a drug problem. Uh, and some of you may have been in that place, too, that you had a drug problem, you know, that your parent drug you to church. Uh, <laughs> And so when I left home, I said, that's it. And I went to Korea, my first base. That's why I left. Went to basic training, uh, finished up tech school, got to Korea, and was living OK. So I thought. I thought I was doing all right. Um, I wasn't crazy bad, but I was bad. Uh, but the Bible says that if I've offended in one point, uh, offended the law in one point, then I'm, I'm a sinner. So I'm a sinner. 
you know, I'm, I'm doing what sinners do, right? Uh, living my life. I PCS from there. Uh, I go to Guam. Things are great. You know, the career is looking pretty good. Uh, have some successes uh, in my career, you know, some recognition. Like, hey, man, I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good. Got out to Barksdale, Louisiana. Uh, and there, same thing, you know, doing pretty good, doing pretty good. And then the Lord started to convict my heart. Uh, I didn't know that's what it was, but that's what it was. Now, in retrospect, I can look back and say that was God dealing with my life, dealing with me as a sinner. Uh, he was dealing with me. I didn't know it. Uh, and so I went on a search. But I said, man, there's got to be more to life than this. Uh, and by more to life, meaning I was getting up, I was going to work, I was, you know, doing everything that you do every day, right? And I said, man, is, is this it? Is this it, Lord? This, is this life? Th to get up, go to work, get up, go to work, sleep, eat, whatever, and then get up and do the same thing again and again. I was like, there's got to be more to life than this. Uh, and, and I found eventually that there was. Um, I was in a uh, relationship that I should not have been in. Uh, it was a sexually immoral relationship, I'll tell you that. Uh, and it was not one that I'm pleased with now to look back on. However, I'm telling you because some of you are in the same boat right now. Uh, and I'm just sharing with you, here's what God can do. He can change your life. Uh, and he wants to change your life. And he grabbed me from that relationship that I was in. And I just had a desire. I said, man, I need to go to church. I started feeling bad. And I told you, when I left home, I was like, I'm done with church. I'm through. I wasn't going back. That's what I thought. Uh, but the God, God began to deal with my heart. And so I, uh, I, I went to church there on base, back at Barksdale Air Force Base, uh, and this was Mother's Day uh, back in the year of 1999, and that day was the day that I gave my life to Christ. I didn't realize that's what I was missing. However, when the sermon came, uh, and on the simple message of Jesus feeding the 5,000 uh, with the fish and the five loaves of bread, I don't know what it was other than the spirit that was dealing with my heart and whooped my head. Uh, and here now I was, this young man, um, standing in front of a church much larger than this one and a lot more people uh, crying like a baby. They don't judge me. Uh, crying like a baby, uh, you know, in, in, in front of this church. And that was my day. And so that was my birthday. And it was Mother's Day, 1999. And so since then, I've been serving the Lord. Uh, hadn't been perfect. Uh, however, I've been striving for perfection. And that's the key. And that's the difference. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, it says a just man falleth seven times but he gets back up again. And so that's the key. When you walk with Christ, it's a walk of I strive for protection, I mean, for perfection. However, if I don't reach it and I don't attain it, God knows my heart. And so he looks at my heart because that's what he judges is my heart. And so I can get back up again. I don't have to stay in that pit. I'm going to hit you with this one real quick and I'm going to shut up on my testimony piece. The prodigal son, if you guys have heard the story before, it was about a young man uh, who had gone to his father in a very presumptuous way and said, hey, dad, give me all that's mine. Basically, I want all my goods, everything that you're going to leave to me. So essentially what he was saying to his father was, I can't wait for you to die. Can you give me what's mine now? And so his dad, being the gracious father that he was, he gave him exactly what he desired. He gave him all of his goods. He split them up between the two brothers, and the one brother went off, and he lived a riotous life. He lived a life in sin. Uh, he lived a life partying, drinking, doing all that he wanted to do. And the Bible says, and basically, he came to nothing, to the point so much so that here he was living and working with pigs as a, as a Jewish boy. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Jews, but they don't deal with anything with the swine. Now, me, I dined on the swine, uh, but they didn't dine on the swine. Uh, they, they didn't dine on the swine, and so they didn't want anything to do with, with, with pigs. And here now, this young man who had been divided and given the goods of his father he had been given, and now he's living and feeding and working with swine. And the Bible says...